You're listening to Lighthearted, the official podcast of the United States Lighthouse Society. My name is Jeremy Dontremont. Welcome. My co-host today is Michelle Jewell Shaw, chairperson of Friends of Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouses. Hi, Michelle. Hi, Jeremy, and hello to all of our listeners out there. Today is March 24th, 2021, and this is a special edition of Lighthearted. As regular listeners know, on this podcast, we talk about all kinds of things related to lighthouses. Today, we're going to talk about a lighthouse that's also a memorial, the Titanic Memorial Lighthouse in New York City. Before we introduce our guests, let's tell everyone about the history of the Memorial Lighthouse. The Titanic Memorial Lighthouse stands today near the buildings of the South Street Seaport Museum at the corner of Fulton and Pearl Streets at the southern end of Manhattan. From 1913 to 1968, it was a familiar sight in its location atop the Siemens Church Institute overlooking the East River. In the early 1900s, the Siemens Church Institute announced plans for a new 12-story headquarters building in Lower Manhattan. The building was to include hundreds of rooms that would serve as transient living quarters for mariners. The lighthouse was a late addition to the plans in response to the Titanic tragedy, and the inclusion of the memorial helped raise more funds. Fundraising was organized by Titanic survivor Margaret Brown, who is posthumously known as the unsinkable Molly Brown, among others. The lighthouse was designed by the architects Warren and Wetmore, who also designed Grand Central Terminal. The cornerstone was laid on April 16, 1912, one day after the news of the sinking of the Titanic reached New York. Many prominent New Yorkers were among the 1,496 lives lost in the disaster. The cylindrical white lighthouse was 60 feet tall. It displayed a fixed green light that was visible throughout New York Harbor and all the way through the Narrows to Sandy Hook, about a dozen miles to the south. Surmounting the tower was a time ball to be hoisted five minutes before noon, Monday through Friday, and dropped at the precise moment a telegraphic signal signifying noon was received from Washington, D.C. Captains in the harbor set their ship's chronometers by the ball drop, as knowing the exact time in relation to longitude allowed for safe navigation. Citizens also would set their timepieces to the drop of the ball at noon each day. The light in the lighthouse and the daily ball drop operated until 1968 when the Siemens Church Institute put the building up for sale. After the organization relocated, the building was demolished. The lighthouse was removed and donated to the South Street Seaport Museum. In May 1976, it was erected at its present location. There is a new effort to restore the Memorial Lighthouse, which has fallen into disrepair. The first step in the rehabilitation will be to have a historic structure report repaired to assess the structural problems and to recommend a restoration program. The members of Friends of Titanic Lighthouse Restoration are also hoping the memorial could be included on the National Register of Historic Places in time for April 15, 2022, the 110th anniversary of the sinking of the liner. Our guests today are Adrian Saker, who is spearheading the restoration effort, and also two descendants of Titanic passengers, Angelica Harris and Simon Medhurst. Angelica Harris is a successful author, historian, entrepreneur, advocate, and speaker. She's the author of the book Titanic, the brothers Paracchio, two boys in a dream. The book is the story of her Italian uncles through marriage, Alberto and Sebastiano Paracchio. The brothers were stewards in the a la carte restaurant on board the Titanic. Simon Medhurst's great-grandfather was Robert Hitchens, the quartermaster of the Titanic, who was at the ship's helm on April 14, 1912. Hitchens survived the disaster in Lifeboat 6. Simon's mission is to keep the story alive and to promote all things Titanic. I spoke with Adrian, Angelica, and Simon a couple of weeks ago. Let's listen to that conversation now. I'm speaking today uh, with Adrian Saker, who is spearheading the effort to restore the Titanic Memorial Lighthouse in New York City. And also with me today are two people who have family ties to people who are on board the Titanic uh, when it sank in 1912, Angelica Harris and Simon Medhurst. Thanks uh, so much to all of you for joining me today. Oh, you're quite welcome. You know, this is a podcast about lighthouses, but I know many people who are interested in lighthouses are certainly also interested in shipwrecks. And the Titanic, of course, is probably of greater interest to 
more people than any shipwreck in history. I think that's a pretty, mm -hmm. pretty safe statement. Adrian, what makes the Titanic Memorial Lighthouse historically important? Well, hi, Jeremy, and, and thank you uh, for inviting us all. And, and thank you for your work with the uh, US uh, Lighthouse Society in preserving these uh, important landmarks. Titanic Memorial Lighthouse was in fact the world's first memorial to Titanic's victims, uh, built and unveiled exactly one year after the tragedy. Titanic, as, as we know, was bound for New York, which was uh, in fact the US home port of the White Star Line. And among its 1,496 victims, were citizens from 28 nations. So it's truly an, an international project. You mentioned the lighthouse was designed by Warren and Wetmore, so it actually has significant architectural merit. It's significant for its residents in, as a national cultural memorial to, to the Titanic disaster. I just, uh, I'd like to read uh, a quote here from the, the president uh, of, the, of the time, sent a telegram three days uh, after the tragedy to the mayor of New York, and it reads this. I wish I was present in New York this afternoon to join my fellow citizens in expressing our grief at the shocking catastrophe to the Titanic and our deep sympathy with the kinsfolk of those who perished, Theo Roosevelt. And he wrote that at 2.30 a.m. So clearly this tragedy was uh, keeping him awake at night. It's historically important as it was an un supposedly unsinkable ship, the call for women and children in the lifeboats, the band that played heroically, as the ship sank beneath the surface. All these are all part of its uh, history. And how was the memorial paid for when it was first built? Uh, it was built by public subscription. Uh, fundraising began almost immediately after the news of the tragedy re reached New York. In fact, on the rescue ship Carpathia that was bound for New York with its survivors, funds were initially raised by uh, Margaret Brown, who was posthumously, as we know, called the uh, unsinkable Molly Brown. Uh, in fact, baseball fans might be interested to know that uh, the Highlanders, who were later to become the Yankees, played the New York Giants in an exhibition game at the Polo Grounds uh, in benefit of the survivors. And funds were forthcoming from that that went towards the victims and also towards the, the lighthouse. Funds were collected by the Seamus Church Institute, where the lighthouse was uh, later to be built at uh, 25 South Street uh, on the roof of the new 13-story headquarters. So Adrian, I want to get back to you in a few minutes about the restoration, but I'd like to bring uh, Angelica and Simon into the conversation. I'd like to find out more about their relation to the Titanic story. So Angelica, uh, you've written a book called Titanic, the Brothers Paracchio. Am I pronouncing that correctly, Angelica? Yes, Titanic, the Brothers Paracchio, Two Boys okay. in a Dream. Yeah, and Titanic, right the Brothers Paracchio, Two Boys in a Dream. I understand uh, it's about two uncles of yours by marriage who yes. were on board the Titanic. Can you tell us about them? Uh, how did they come to be on board Titanic? Both uh, Alberto and Sebastiano worked on the shipyards in Fubina, Alessandria, Italy with their father, uh, my great-grandfather, Carlos Paracchio. And they weren't rich people. They were very, they were basically third class, you know, cargo holders and shippers and, and such. They were schooled in the church in Fubina, Alessandria. They only went to school on Saturday and Sunday, but basically they worked the shipyards, you know, during the week with, with their dad to help keep money in the family and make sure that their large family at the time was, was fed properly and, and cared for. But as Alberto was growing up, working on the shipyards, he found a lot of adventure, shall we say, but he was also very astute in learning language. So besides him knowing his grammatical Italian and the dialect from Fubina, uh, Zio Alberto also was beginning to learn languages like Spanish and French and German. And it was all because while he was reading the rosters from the victualing or from the cargo. And as he was reading these other languages from different countries, he was beginning to be able to help others, even though he was young and only 12, 13 years old, he was beginning to be able to help others, you know, on the shipyards, tell them, well, this box belongs here and this box belongs there. As Titanic, you know, was beginning to be built, or actually Titanic was on the building side, but the Olympic was beginning to set sail. And a man named Luigi Gotti at the time who was the subcontracted uh, restaurateur for the a la carte, started watching him while he was on 
you know, watch while he was on the Olympic directing. Here was this young boy. I think he was about now about 15 years old. This young boy directing traffic like, you know, like a street lamp, <laughs> looking at boxes and telling people where to go and writing things down. And he began to realize that Zio Alberto, not only at his young age, but had this wide, vast knowledge of language and grammar. And he approached my grandfather and, you know, spoke to him and said to him, I would like to get to know your son because... He has a, a knowledge of where things belong and how to organize. And I need that in my restaurant. Mm -hmm. I need that at, because he was working with many countries to, because as you know, with the a la carte restaurant, it wasn't, it was a for, for the first class dining salon, but it was also, you know, an outshoot. So if anybody didn't want the duck all orange for dinner, they could go to the uh, the a la carte and have something else. Maybe they wanted spaghetti and meatballs, or maybe they wanted something less heavy for the night. Maybe their stomach was bothering them and they just wanted something simple to eat. Mm -hmm. They could get that in the a la carte. So it ended up being at by the tender age of 16, Luigi decided he wanted my uncle to work for him and brought him into the fold and brought him to England to start training him to work in his restaurant. That's how he started. So he started on the Olympic working. And then as Titanic was being built, he was training him to work on the Titanic. And then as about six, seven months before the Titanic was about to sail, Luigi realized, I need more help. And then Alberto commissioned his brother, Sebastiano, to come. All his expenses were paid to travel to England to be trained by Luigi. And then by then, both brothers were being ready and me being made ready to sail on the Titanic. So why do you feel in general that the crew of the, uh, the a la carte restaurant is important to the Titanic story? Oh, that's easy. Hmm. Big word, immigration. They were not related or to any of the White Star Line crew. They weren't officers. They weren't citizens of England. Well, I take that back. Luigi Gotti had a dual citizenship. He was citizen of Italy and he was also a citizen of England. By the time uh, Titanic set sail, my uncle was becoming a dual citizen of England. So many of his um, relatives also had dual citizenships. But dual citizenships or not, they were still considered Italian immigrants and they weren't allowed to become officers on the White Star Line at all. But in the meantime, their immigration status coming to America was a lifelong dream of many of the, their relatives on, in Fubina to be able to have their boys work on the ships and then work, of course, on the most famous ship of all, Titanic, for them to be able to land when I think it was supposed to be April 18th here in New York City. This was supposed to be a whole new life. Luigi wanted to open up a restaurant here in, in New York, take his crew and have them work here, open up a new school, teach culinary arts here in America, and then help with building new young men working on the ships and more restaurants on different ships and different liners in, for America and, or for England or Italy. But of course, we know it never, it never happened. So did the did the story of the uh, the crew of the Alcott restaurant, did it have any special meaning to others in, in similar positions, do you think? I think so. And I think the way the crew died, too, had also deep, significant meaning, because when I started my journey learning about my uncles there through their younger brother. My uncle Modesto was five years old when his brothers passed away on Titanic. He didn't know anything about why his brothers died. He knew that they worked on Titanic. The ships hit an iceberg. It sank. They died. That was it. That's a succession of what he was told. Because of the consequences of their death, the family had, didn't want anything to do with Titanic. And the consequences were they weren't, they were told to stay in their cabin. They were not allowed to come up. Now here they were crew, subcontracted or otherwise, 
why can't we put on life jackets and go up and help women and children get on the lifeboats? Why can't we assist and then have some way, God willing, to even jump ship and save our lives or whatever it was? But they were told to stay below deck because they weren't considered official crew. And there was also some prejudices, too, about them. They weren't English. They weren't Irish. Um, why should they be able to, why should they, you know, be a part of this? And unfortunately, 38 members all died together. The irony of their death was right before they died, the exact same night, the Weiners commissioned Luigi Gotti and crew to have this massive dinner for Captain Smith for his retirement. And it was right there in the cafe where every, every single person of elite status was there and they were feeding them. So imagine feeling like the masters of the culinary arts, you know, feeding the captain, his crew, John Jacob Astor, Isidore and Ida Strauss, Guggenheim, all of them. Imagine feeding these people and these people in your restaurant in their you know, tuxedos and tails and top hats and the women in their gowns and gorgeous jewelry. And then Titanic hits an iceberg and you're told to stay downstairs. Right. How, how do you accept that in your head right before you die? Yeah. How do you accept the facts that here you were with the masters of art, the masters of, of the world, and no one's there to rescue you? Right. That's a very hard thing to think about. And their families thought about that very hard, too. So there's a lot of fascinating aspects to their story. And uh, as we mentioned, you've uh, written a book about them. I can understand why you would, would want to do that. How long did you work on the book? The book altogether took me from, let me see, um, my uncle commissioned me in 1977, 78, something, something like that. And the book was finally published in... 2019. So it was actually 42 years of research. Wow. Mm -hmm. 42 years of long research, I have to say, because back then, some of the materials I really needed wasn't readily available. Also, I had family members who just didn't want to talk to me. You know, they're dead. They're buried. Leave me alone. I don't want to talk about it. Yeah. But, you know, it wasn't until some other family members decided to open up to me, talk to me. Mm -hmm. And before you knew it, I had started getting some little increments of where they could have been. Sure. And then he's one of my Titanic heroes, Charlie Haas. He wrote Titanic Destination Disaster. And after I found out that the boys were working on a ship, on the ship in a restaurant, I read Charlie Haas's book, Charlie Haas and Jack Eaton's book, made Jack Rest in Peace. And on page 93 on that book, I'll never forget the page number. It spoke about Luigi Gotti and the restaurant and the Italian crew. And I went, that was my key. You know, if it was, only, it was the key to open up other doors or shall we say the smoking gun. Mm -hmm. And that was the, the lead in to find more, you know, about them. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, a lot of a lot of good things take a long time to get done. And it sounds like uh, it was certainly worth uh, putting all the that time and, and effort and work into well, it over those years. Well, for me, when I made the promise to my uncle, that was a promise made, a promise kept. I could not break my promise. That's a great, it's, a, it's all a great story. And you're writing the book is a part of that great story. So let me move to Simon. Uh, Simon, again, thanks for, for being with us today. And your great grandfather, Robert Hitchens, was the quartermaster of the Titanic. So what's important about his story? Uh, first of all, thank you, Jeremy, for invited me on the on the podcast uh yes so with with robert i think it's um i suppose the important about the story is actually about him because i think robert's not really a known figure i think you talk about the captain and you talk about lightoller and murdoch and you have others connected with the titanic story but if if very often if you mention robert hitchens he wasn't very well known at all and i think that was that was I suppose that's my mission really to make his name known but also to have the truth about him that's why i feel it's important that 
his story is told purely because there's so many wrongs that have been put forward about Robert. And I just want to put some of those things right, uh, I suppose. So it's rather truth and fiction. I think that's really where, where I'm aiming with, with the story of, of Robert Hitchens. Now, I listened to another podcast where you were interviewed and you talked about this. I, I heard about how you uh, started collecting Titanic memorabilia when you were quite young. But then uh, the amazing thing is that you didn't know that you were related to somebody on the Titanic until later. Could you say a little bit about that? Yeah, it's a, it is a very strange um, event. I mean, I, I couldn't, I can't actually tell you the whole thing because it's just too much of it. I was probably in my early 20s when I started collecting Titanic memorabilia. I, I quite like social history, so I, I used to collect other things, but I, I started collecting signatures uh, of survivors, uh, models, books, anything I could get my hand on. And then um, I suppose I was doing that for, for many years, and it wasn't till uh, it was only until 2012, so it's exactly 100 years later, that um, I actually had a phone call from my, I suppose we call my stepdad, saying, I think we know who your, your real dad is. And there's a long story around that too, which is, which is quite amazing. But um, yeah, so I, I got in contact with him and he had found out. But I had a, I had a picture, uh, which was of me being held by what my mum used to say was my, my real nan. So I, I had this picture, this black and white picture. Yeah, that's how old I am. Um, so there's this black and white picture of, of me being held by my, my grandmother. And, um, and it wasn't until I got in contact with my birth dad that he said, well, actually, I took that picture. And obviously that, that lady is, is Ivy Hitchens, which is Robert Hitchens' daughter. So in some sense, it was quite, it was a, a real, I think, you know, when you've been collecting Titanic memorabilia for, for years, and you've collected signatures, and then you realise actually that you you turn out to be a closer relative than, than a lot of the signatures you've been collecting, huh. and it became a bit it became a bit of bizarre um, sort of situation really. So um, um, yeah, so I, it, it opened the whole whole new realm of of what Titanic meant to me because it wasn't just something I was collecting; it was actually part of me. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it became a real strange journey. So. Potentially, I've only really known. I didn't even know who Robert which Hitchin was before uh, 2012. I, I knew the, the basics of who who was on Titanic and, and bits and pieces, but uh, it wasn't until 2012 that actually all started off. And then after that, it's been just a roller coaster journey, really, just to learn about him and obviously get to know my family after 45 years. Mm. So wow. you know, it was, I was 45 when I found out. Uh, so I've been collecting since my early 20s. So it was a real strange. And then it being 2012 as well. It was a real, real sort of strange journey. Yeah. So, yeah, that's really the basics of that's the skeleton of it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's an amazing story. And then it happened. You found out 100 years uh, after the Titanic disaster. Is kismet the right word for that? Just seems uh, like said more than a coincidence. It seemed like there was something else at work besides a coincidence there. So let me ask you, how did Robert Hitchens become the quartermaster of the Titanic? Uh, what, what were his qualifications for that? So obviously, he was born in Newland, uh, which was a, um, a fishing village, I suppose, or town. And he then, obviously, the sea was in his blood. So straight away, at the age of 21, he was on to the, the, the HMS RMS Revenge, which was a Royal Navy ship. He was 21 then. He was, on, he was 29 when he actually was on Titanic. So... It seemed that he went up very quickly up the ranks because he talks about in the inquiry of, of being a quartermaster for sort of seven or eight years. So he was, by the time he'd actually reached Titanic, he'd been on the troop ship Dongola and he'd been on other ships as a quartermaster before that. And obviously Titanic was, was probably his peak of his career to go on to Titanic. So we don't really hear much about his past uh, except... Um, obviously where I've I've been sort of searching into the life of Robert Hitchens and you actually look at his sort of naval history it's huge I thought that you would you know when somebody joined a ship that was basically it for life uh, and then I suddenly realized that's not the case uh, they were very much on, on a ship for six months three six months a year then they would mm -hmm. go to another ship and when you when you look at the list of, of ships that he was on, 
it, it's just huge. And um, I didn't realise how big a task it would be to actually try and find the ships that he was on. By the time he got to Titanic, he was he was fully qualified and at, at, in a, really at the top of his game. How old was he when he was on the Titanic? He was 29. Wow. Wow. I was, I, I, I was thinking older than that. Mm. So as the quartermaster, uh, what were his responsibilities when he was assigned to Lifeboat 6? Yeah, I, he. I mean, obviously, he would have um, four hourly shifts, two hours waiting by the wheel and then two hours on the wheel. Uh, and then eventually, you say, when, when the iceberg they hit the iceberg, he was then ordered to go to lifeboats. Well, he, was, he, he unhooked um, another lifeboat first, but then was told to go on lifeboat six. Each of the quartermasters were given a specific lifeboat that they would be in charge of. That's why all the quarter, quartermasters survived, because they were all given a lifeboat that they were in charge of. And Robert was in charge of lifeboat six. So it wasn't just a matter of him being a passenger in Lifeboat 6. He was in charge of Lifeboat 6. And I think it's quite important, I think, to the whole story of, of Robert on Lifeboat 6 is to understand that he, he wasn't a passenger or just another crewman on Lifeboat 6. He was actually given full authority, if you like, he was captain of that lifeboat. So he was that was his lifeboat and everybody on board was his responsibility. So he was put on the, the port side, which was uh, Lightoller's, side and and that side was only women and children which was women and children only so those boats that went off on the port side only went with women and children murdoch was on the starboard side which was women and children first then men so um there was a little bit of discrepancy on the on the on whichever whichever side you were on of the ship would probably depend on you it would you know would be your fate really um but so light on have sent uh, Robert, and he was told to go to um, a light in the distance, which is exactly what he did. There was there was nothing else that he was asked to do. He wasn't ever called back, uh, and he was only just given that one rule to go to the light in the distance, drop off passengers, and then and then come back to collect any survivors after that. Yeah, and uh, I'm sure a lot of people know this if they. Certainly, if they saw the 1997 movie Titanic or a lot of other versions of the, the telling of the story, he's kind of portrayed as a, a villain. I think it's probably especially in that movie. So overall, do you think history has been fair to him? I, I would be honest and said no. I think especially the film probably has, has put a big, uh, big dark cloud over Robert. I think uh, especially with, I mean, the best of men are only men at best. And I think that's the that's the thing there with with Robert. He he was a man. He was given charge of the lifeboat, and when all said and done, he was he was the ruler of that lifeboat. And if if someone was to tell him that I want to do this or I want to do that, he would say no. I'm in charge. Uh, he was you know. And I think if you read the the inquiry, and I think the inquiry is is a, a huge wealth of information. If if you want to know. I suppose the life of Robert, he, he gives a lot of detail in the inquiry into what he did and what he didn't do. And he, he talks about a lot of, of injustice, really, how that things have said about him that were not true, you know, that he was drunk and that he, he did this and he did that, when actually, you know, he was given a spoonful of, of whiskey at, to, to warm him up. And he says in the inquiry that he stood the whole night at the, at the tiller, making sure that he was guided to 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 safety and he was given a, a lot of half wet half dry blanket to keep him to try and keep him warm he had no hat so there's a lot of things that that were in I suppose not in Robert's favor at that point and I think none of us were there uh, he wasn't an angel but I certainly feel that he was in my mind he's he was definitely a hero and I think that the film didn't really put him that way. And also things that were said in the lifeboat that were never actually in the film, you know, never actually happened in real life. Um, I think one example would be the, um, I suppose, the, the, when it says about shutting the hole in your face, was which Michael was, Brown, right? yeah, which actually was, um, according to Mrs. White, it was actually in lifeboat eight and it was Abel's body, Seaman Jones. So it wasn't even in, in lifeboat six at all. Yeah. So, um, I mean, he does actually say in the inquiry that he didn't, he was also not told to go back. He was not asked to go back by anybody. 
And mm. certainly in the film, it, it talks about, shows a picture of Captain Smith calling back Lifeboat Six, which never happened mm. either. But he was a, it was a, it was a mile it was a mile away when when the Titanic went down. So you know, he, his intention was to get away from the ship, and he talks about that it being a dangerous place to be. And uh, so I spoke to David Hazeman, who's the son of Edith Hazeman, who was a, a survivor, and he was he was a quartermaster for years. And he said there were certain things that you you didn't do when you were on a lifeboat, or you did do, if you like. And that was, firstly, you kept well away because of the suction of the ship. Secondly, that things were often thrown overboard. You'd have deck chairs and all sorts of bits of furniture thrown off over the deck. So you'd want to make sure your lifeboat was well away from then. Also being swamped when that meant nobody was being saved. So there, there was, you know, there was a lot there involved. And I, But yes, I think he'd been pasted as a, a villain but I feel like very much so that he should have been uh, put over as, as a hero and getting all those passengers all the survivors to Carpathia and he says in the inquiry that he was the last one off the boat he made sure that everybody was off and everybody was safe. Well it's a shame he's been portrayed that way I guess uh, you know um, James Cameron and other people who've written uh, things about the Titanic just felt like they needed some some villains in there. And, uh, <laughs> He was, uh, and he, he was also from Cornwall, so he wasn't he wasn't a, a Cockney. Um, so, uh, oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> well, that's important too. But I guess to the most Americans, it might not matter. But certainly to uh, <laughs> the people in uh, Great Britain, that matters. So, what happened to Robert Hitchens after the Titanic disaster? I think, um, yeah, I think it's that's probably another thing. Is he did have a troubled life? Uh, he suffered a lot. You you probably call it post traumatic stress from 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 what happened and I think that did it did live with him his whole life really but um I think it's interesting because very often people say oh, it must have been a Jonah he probably didn't go anywhere after that he just sort of drifted away and didn't didn't have any work and but actually he, he went on straight away to be a quartermaster on on many ships none as none as big as obviously as Titanic but looking into the history of, of Robert and looking at some of the ships that he went on, uh, Caledonia, he was a, a quartermaster at the age of 34. Um, so he, he had lots of jobs as quartermaster, second mate, third mate, and it went on like that. So yeah, he, he went on to be on ships well after Titanic. Though I think if you look into the life of, of Robert, there were things in his life that, that were sad and, and he, he had troubles in his life definitely later on. One thing is that he was married and obviously he had his children and his wife had, um, I think it was a tumour later on in life. And, and she actually died on the, on March the 23rd in 1940. And he actually died on the 23rd of September, 1940. So wow. Ooh, wow. very, very quickly after. And, and he died of heart failure. And I think a lot of people think, well, he talks about never getting over his wife's death, never got over it. And I think it, it was really... If you want to put it romantically as a, a broken heart, I think right. very much so. He, he loved his wife a lot, and I think it, it was, you know, part of his troubles at the end even. Yeah, people uh, do die of broken hearts. I think that's a fact. Yes. Yeah. So he's only in his 50s. That's not very old. Uh, 58. 58, yeah. So are you uh, writing or planning to write a book on your great-grandfather? Right. Well, it's an interesting one because um, there is actually a book been written about Robert Hitchens. Uh, it was written by Sally Nielsen, who is my second cousin. And she wrote, she, she obviously knew Robert. Was, she was related to, to the family right, right from the word go. So she, she'd been preparing that about Robert Hitchens for a long time. So she, there's, a, there's a good book if you want to know. It's, it's actually called Man That Sank Titanic, The Troubled Life of Robert Hitchens. And uh, she wrote that book. And it's, it's some ways that's been quite helpful for me to get a, a good grounding uh, of the life of Robert. Um, I didn't have to go searching too hard. I had the book to give me that information. But um, believe it or not, I am actually doing a book, which I actually will be sending to the publishers probably this weekend. I've actually got as far as finishing it this weekend. But it's not about Robert, but I won't, I won't give too much away. But it's it's a Titanic book, but mm -hmm. it's going to be going to the publisher. The publishers have accepted it and it's all ready to go. So hopefully by this weekend it will be publishers and then they can spend their time editing it and, and as it goes on wow but yes i am doing a book so yeah. that should be 
Yay. <laughs> okay. Congratulations on that. That's that's exciting. Well, I'll be looking for that. I'd like to, if I may, just respond to Simon Angelica's. Yes. You know, I'm not related to anyone on Titanic or any family history connected to it, but listening to Simon Angelica's, uh, you know, quite powerful recollections, it's clear that there were no survivors of Titanic. The history that I've read is filled with shortened lives and uh, un unhappy endings. And it's really, to me, important that these stories are recalled. Uh, this is living history. And that Simon, Angelica, and many of the other descendants are allowed to have a voice. Absolutely. Thank well you. said. Uh, so, Adrian, one of the things that made the Titanic Memorial Lighthouse unusual and certainly different from any other lighthouse, well, almost any other lighthouse that I know about, was something called uh, its time ball. Can you explain uh, what the time ball was? Yeah, it's a, it's a fascinating device. You know, although it was a memorial, the lighthouse um, did have a practical use. Uh, you know, this is a, a pre-radio, pre-quartz, pre-digital era, and it was effective in synchronizing ships' chronometers uh, between, while they're in port between voyages. How it worked was pilots and captains across New York Harbor would set their ships' chronometers as the signal ball drops. And of course, since time equals longitude, Setting longitude and latitude against this time allows for safe and accurate navigation. A, a pole extended up uh, a cylindrical cupola which held this time ball, and five minutes before noon each day, uh, it was raised to the top of the rod, and exactly at 12 noon, a magnet released an electrical current, and the ball dropped. Uh, and of course, the time square ball drop is a direct relation. It went in service for the first time on November the 1st, which happens to be my birthday, uh, 1913. And it uh, operated regularly every day on weekends and holidays for about 56 years. Mm -hmm. In this pre-quartz, pre-digital era, it's how New York kept time. And I, I like to think of how all eyes in the seaport district, in downtown New York, across the harbor, they all lifted to this time ball on the 13th floor of the Siemens Church Institute and set their fob watches as it dropped. It's yeah, really yeah. that significant in terms of its uh, merit as, as a device in New York City. A lot of interesting aspects to that. The, so is the uh, the ball drop on New Year's Eve in New York City, would you say that's kind of a descendant of the, the ball on the lighthouse? It predates it by a few years. Oh, okay. And in fact, the time ball as a device has antecedents in the UK and many other cities. In fact, I believe there's one in, in Greenwich, but in the US, there's only one other period time ball that exists, and that's the uh, that's the Plymouth Light, which was 1910, as uh, I'm sure your your listeners know. That's at Gunner Point and at the entrance of uh, Plymouth Bay in Massachusetts. But I will say it's non-functional, as ours is currently. However, we yeah. hope to uh, fix that soon. So do you think when the lighthouse was in its original position on top of the Siemens Church Institute, did it serve as a navigational aid? Well, it was certainly more symbolic than navigational. We do know that it was designed to be seen from Sandy Hook, which uh, is at the entrance to New York Harbor. That's about 12 miles distance. Likely it could have been seen further out at sea, but unfortunately we don't have those records. Though it was a, it have a signature fixed green light. For your listeners, they might be interested to know that the beacon consisted of three Cooper Hewitt mercury lamps rated at 2,500 CP each. In fact, the, the U.S. Coast Guard uh, did designate this uh, nine-ton copper lighthouse as an official guide to navigation. We, we found those records. Oh, and okay. in World War II, it was uh, extinguished for the duration, of course, uh, right. as were most other beacons uh, around That's the world. But it shined for fully 56 years. Wow. wow. I didn't realize it was uh, on the official list as, a, as an official aid to navigation. That's that's really interesting. So uh, how did this effort, this current effort to restore the Titanic Memorial Lighthouse, how did that get started? Well, like most New Yorkers, I've walked past this lighthouse for many years without noticing it. About three years ago, I think I stopped and I read the plaque and uh, I thought it was sad that a structure relating to such an important ship and its history was was forgotten. And moreover, that none of the names of the victims were, were recorded. I, I found that a little odd. So we decided to form Friends of Titanic Lighthouse Restoration, its first member being Helen Benziger, who's the great-granddaughter of the unsinkable Margaret Brown. 
then Sally and Simon joined us, uh, as we know, Robert's uh, relations, and Angelica joined us in 2020 as our descendant advocate. Wow. At this point, what kind of membership and support do you have? Well, we have a broad range of uh, supporters and followers, I'm, I'm happy to say. Uh, we're honoured to have supporters amongst descendants, including, uh, as I mentioned, uh, Margaret Tobin Brown, uh, J. Bruce Ismay, uh, Major Arthur Pugin, uh, Major Archibald Butt, uh, Stoker William Besson, Deck Engineer Thomas Miller, and the Countess of Rothes. Relations are all supporters and, and many others, of course. We've also got political support from uh, the Congressman uh, Gerald Nadler, uh, State Senator Brian Kavanagh, uh, Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer, and our local councillor Margaret Chin. So we're, we're, it's really terrific levels of support at uh, the elected levels. The community realised this important asset is on their doorstep, and CB1 have voted unanimously 46 to 0 for immediate in situ restoration. Anyone familiar with community boards know that you don't get any unanimous vote on anything. So we're, we're really thrilled to, to get that. Amen. That's all. That's all impressive. Uh, so who owns the lighthouse today? The South Street Seaport Museum were gifted the light tower by the Siemens Church Institute when their building was uh, sadly demolished in 1969. Uh, the museum have been the custodians have since, but due to lack of funding and staff, they've been unable to begin any form of restoration, which is which has led to the opening uh, for us to come in and help support this uh, project. What is the, the overall plan for the restoration? Yes, well, our goal is restoration of the light tower to its 100% original architecture. Uh, it's an original working condition. Now, that would include restoring the lamp, uh, the mechanical time ball, the walkways, and hopefully the brickwork. Now, of course, the brickwork is long gone. Uh, this may involve firing it or sourcing it, one of the two, but we'd like to have its integrity uh, as much as impossible to get back to its original condition. So is the lighthouse going to be moved to a new location? Yeah, it was originally, uh, as mentioned, on the 13th floor, the top floor of the Siemens Church Institute right. down on State Street. And historically has been moved since then several times from that original location. It currently stands next to the crosswalk on Water Street and the Seaport District. But perhaps it might be better suited if it's closer to the river as its original history and, and function demands. So uh, we hope that it may move closer to the East River to signal river traffic. That would be a wonderful thing. Yeah, it will be. After uh, restoration, it's actually going to end up in a, in a different location. Uh, where exactly is that location? Yeah, so the Seaport Museum have agreed that its current location is not entirely appropriate for a place of reflection and remembrance and have agreed that it should move from Titanic Memorial Park to elsewhere. Where exactly that is, is yet to be determined, but we feel, as previously mentioned, uh, it's a lighthouse. It should be by a river so ships can see it. So how are you funding the restoration? The funding is coming from, from various groups. Currently, we have a GoFundMe page and uh, we've been supported generously by descendants and uh, individuals who feel that the lighthouse is important of restoration. Uh, we're also looking into grants and other sources of, of funding. Is there any international involvement in the restoration effort? There certainly is. Uh, we're supported internationally by numerous Titanic societies, including, and I have a list here, uh, I, I certainly need to, to, to mention their names, the British Titanic Society, the Belfast Titanic Society, the Titanic Historical Society, and the International, which are both US-based, the Titanic Society of Atlantic Canada, also French, German, and Russian societies. Now, why is that important? Well, it, it's truly an international project because citizens of 28 nations perished aboard Titanic. Uh, we, we tend to think that it's sort of a British and American story, but that's not entirely the case. The second most spoken language on Titanic was Swedish. Ah, well, it's interesting because certainly Angelica talked about, about that. It certainly yeah. speaks to the broad range of nationalities that were aboard Titanic and, and sadly perished. What is the, the target date for restoration? Is there a target date? We hope to have some element of restoration uh, completed by April the 15th, 2022, which is, of course, the 110th anniversary of the tragedy. Now, whether that comes to pass is fully dependent on how much money we raise, but we felt that it's important to uh, put a line in the sand, so to speak, uh, that we mm -hmm. can move uh, and, and it would truly be a special day if we had something to unveil. Oh, yeah. Wow, that'd be absolutely perfect. Let me move back to uh, Angelica and Simon. 
Angelica, I'll ask you first. Why do you feel the restoration of the Titanic Memorial Lighthouse is important? Oh, I could go on and on about that. But um, first, I want to say, I really need to say this publicly. Thank you, Adrian, for commissioning me to be the descendant advocate for Titanic Memorial Lighthouse. Um, It is an honor to do so. Uh, First of all, if you go to New York City and you stand there on Pearl and Water Streets and you see her gray body standing there, and I mean, she no longer looks like, she looks like the ghost of herself. And you look at her plaque and you see the Titanic Memorial Lighthouse and you think about why is this here where there are buildings surrounding her? She can't, she can no longer light up to anyone. And if you put a beacon on top of her, she'll be in everyone else's eyes every night and she'll be completely, she'll end up becoming a nuisance instead of something welcome. But anyway, the, the ship itself, Titanic has such a history and so many people from so many places in the globe, I believe 28 countries were represented on Titanic. And here she is sitting there, the ghost of herself, she's been stripped and she literally looks like she belongs in the ocean with Titanic at this point, stripped of her beauty, stripped of, you know, her honor and her dignity. And here is something that it's so important to not only the people who died on Titanic, but the people who built Titanic, the people who dreamed, you know, for a better life on Titanic, the immigration. I I keep going back to immigration because of the people who were on Titanic. I mean, not just my uncles, but I mean, like Robert Hitchens, for instance, he was, if you want, even though he was an officer on Titanic, he was also an immigrant. He wasn't an American citizen. So you're talking about people who were looking for a better life. And here is this beacon that can't even shine for them anymore. You know, it would be like if the, the World Trade Center had no museum, had no memorial pool, right. had no, I mean, every, every anniversary here in New York City. Um, That whole week, there are two blue beacons that shine all the way up. And I could see them here in Queens for the memorial of those two over 2000 people who died that day. But for Titanic and the 28 countries that she represents, there is not one beacon here. There aren't there isn't a beacon anywhere Mm -hmm. for them. So this beacon is a beacon of hope. Because, I mean, and for me right now, look what's happened. I mean, it may sound political, but we have to think about people who have died in the um, in 9-11. Many of them were immigrants. Many of them were, were here from other countries working in the World Trade Center. It, after all, that was the name. That was its name, World Trade Center. Now we have COVID-19. COVID-19 is a global epidemic. I mean, our president spoke last night that over 500,000 people died. And those numbers add up to over the amount of people who died in World War I, World War II, the Gulf War, 9-11, Vietnam. So how can we not erect a beacon of hope, not just to welcome ships, but to welcome immigrants, to... I'd love to see it as I love to see in her base and place of education. So have, you know, a, a museum inside about Titanic. But what about an educational place so that children could become educated, not just become educated about Titanic, but about global events around the world, stories told about global events around the world. That's why it's important to me. And Adrian can tell you. I was very emotional when we had on December 6th, uh, 2020, we had our first ever laying down of wreaths. We had a wreath from the Friends of the Titanic Memorial Lighthouse, one from the Titanic Book Club, one from my organization. I am the New York uh, correspondent for the Titanic Society of Atlantic Canada. And then I put a, uh, a wreath down for my uncles. It was the first time a wreath was ever placed in honor of them. And I was, we had a picture and Adrian 
had a, a machine. I called it a magic machine. It laminated the picture right away and stuck it right in the, in the wreath. And I became emotional because it was the first time ever my uncles had a wreath or shall we say a grave to put on. That's why it's important because it becomes a place where every single member could have finally have some place of respite. And here in New York City alone, we have countless places of Titanic memorials. And why can't we need to raise her to be the lead of those Titanic memorials? She's, yeah. She could be a beacon of hope for the world right now. Sure. And, ev and every night when her light shines or every day when that time ball goes down, and we sync, we all synchronize our clocks together. The whole world could synchronize their clocks to being one whole global world. Wow. And hopefully in peace. We need that right now. Oh, we sure do. It's a lot of powerful stories connected to the Titanic and, and to the memorial. You know, I was there uh, a number of years ago now. I was working on a book on New York lighthouses and I went to photograph it. What struck me is the way crowds of people are just, just filing by, just walking by around it without having any, taking any notice of it or probably having any idea of what it was. And that needs to be changed. It needs to be uh, restored and made into a, a more, uh, possibly a more extensive memorial as uh, Adrian's talked about. So Simon, let me ask you, why do you feel the restoration is important? Um, I think that, I mean, how you follow Angelica's um, words, I don't know. But um, you could sort of say, why, why would somebody in the United Kingdom be interested in a memorial in New York, what, what, why would you be interested in that? Because you know you've got uh, Southampton, you've got Belfast, you've got all the all these memorials this side of of, of the of the pond. Why, why are you interested in that? And I think, as Angelica said, really, it's because it's international, because of the of the of the twenty eight groups of of languages and and nations involved. It's it's important to everybody because it is a lasting memory to everybody. Uh, it's not just an American uh, memorial. It is an international memorial that needs to to be to be shown. I think, as as Angela has said as well, concerning the generations to come, we we need to make these things solid now, so that we don't they're not lost for the future generations. You know, when a memorial sits there, um, as as Angela has said, almost a, a ghost of itself, that should be as she said already, a beacon of hope for the future mm. so that the generations to come will see that and, and know why that is there. And rather than it actually being just a history on a book, in a, on a page, that they can actually go somewhere and see something that actually speaks history. You know, it's actually a physical part of history that they can go to and say, you know, this was actually put here by Molly Brown. You know, this was put here by by people who had a, a, a real desire for me to know about this in the future. That's why it was put there. It wasn't put there just for, for them, for that generation, and then, and then to be just, just and just off. You know, it's, it's been put there for us and for the next generation and the next generation. So I think for me, that's why it's important. That's why, as a, as a relative, I feel in, impassioned, really, that, that this Titanic Memorial Lighthouse be supported and I, I my, my weight is right behind it um whichever way I can to support it and I think that's why it's so important because it's something for everybody but not just for us now but for generations to come really well said by by both of you and I just want to point out I haven't said earlier that Simon you're coming to us from uh, Essex uh, in England and uh, Angelica and Adrian are in New York City so just to and we're all speaking through the magic of zoom here today so I just <laughs> wanted to mention that those are beautiful words from, from Simon and Angelica. Uh, I think what it's important to understand is that Titanic is, is an uh, immigration story. Uh, the British Board of Trade designated Titanic as an emigrant ship. So for all its glitz and glamour, it was really how people came to the new world. And there's this wonderful quote that uh, was spoken at its uh, original 1913 dedication and I'll read it if I may. The Titanic Memorial Lighthouse will be given in memory of those who perished without ever realizing the hopes in the new land, the America of endless possibilities. It will be a monument to every person without regard to rank, race, creed, or color, 
whose life went down when the giant vessel slipped beneath the waves. Uh, let me ask you, if people are interested in finding out more about the Titanic Memorial Lighthouse Restoration Project, or if they'd like to make a donation to help out, uh, how would you suggest they find out more information? Well, thank you. Yeah, we're in the midst of a fundraising campaign, funds that will go directly 100% to restore the memorial. Uh, they can visit our website at titaniclighthouse.org, and there they'll find a link. They can also go to GoFundMe, and our page is Restore Titanic Memorial Lighthouse. I'm happy to say that we've raised 2000 of the $4,000 required for a historic structure report. Mm -hmm. And perhaps people already know that that's the first step uh, towards restoration. Any donor will add to our honor roll and they'll be included in the historical record as such. I want to urge our listeners, I'm sure there's a lot of people uh, who have a great interest in everything we've talked about today. I hope some of them uh, will donate to the project. Uh, and, uh, you know, my hope is this, this is all going to go viral, so to speak. That's maybe not a good word to use these days, but, no. <laughs> um, you know, as far as uh, spreading the word, it's going to be kind of uh, exponential, I think, uh, with uh, Titanic buffs and lighthouse buffs. And I'm glad you're bringing uh, lighthouse lovers into, into the mix here, because I think uh, a lot of people re really take a great interest in this. We're looking to a post-COVID time when uh, we can all gather again. And our goal is that this beacon of hope, as Angelica has described it, will be a draw for U.S. and international visitors to come back to New York City, uh, to come back to downtown in, in large numbers. I think, to sum up what uh, some have said to me in the past, once Titanic has you in her grasp, she never lets you go. That's for sure. So, uh, Angelica, Simon, and Adrian, I, I thank you so much for spending this time with me. Uh, it's all absolutely fascinating. I feel like we could talk for hours and hours, and maybe, well, abs absolutely, we need to do it again as the project moves forward. So, this is just part one, I would say. Um, so, may I say one thing before you go? Sure. It's just a public mes message. I'm just yep. asking everyone, be brave. Go get your vaccine. Go get vaccinated. There's Second. there. Yes. So that we could all be together again. We need, we need that. You I know. second that thought, yeah. Yep, go get your vaccines, everybody. Thanks for saying that. But again, uh, I thank the three of you so much. And we're definitely going to do it again. Thank you. I, I really appreciate this. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank you very much. Yeah, great. Right. To learn more about the Titanic Memorial Lighthouse Restoration Project, visit titaniclighthouse.org. Angelica Harris's book, Titanic, The Brothers Paracchio, Two Boys in a Dream, is available at Amazon and other online booksellers. I always urge people to support lighthouse preservation when they can. This one's a little different because it's not a lighthouse that was built by the federal government, but for all the reasons our guests spoke about today, the Titanic Memorial Lighthouse should be preserved. All the people who died on the Titanic, including the immigrants who dreamed of a better life in America, deserve to have a restored beacon of hope in their honor. There's currently a GoFundMe page for raising funds. Just go to GoFundMe.com and search for Titanic Memorial and you'll find it. As always, thanks to all the members, volunteers, staff, and board of directors of the U.S. Lighthouse Society and its chapters and affiliates. Go to uslhs.org to learn all about the things the society does. All donations support this podcast and other education and preservation projects. Coming up this Sunday, March 28th, episode 111 of Lighthearted will focus on two lighthouses, Pedos Island in Washington and Cape Canaveral in Florida. As always, thanks for listening and keep a good light.